Hello, welcome. I'm Scott Graffius and this is But First the Team. I want to mention up front that for content accessibility uh, purposes, this presentation deliberately uses large size fonts and some high contrast elements. And I'll also be describing the on screen content. In a few cases, there's very little text on screen and I'll be reading it word for word or thereabouts. But for most of the presentation, that's not the case. It won't be a verbatim reading of uh, exactly what's on screen, but rather just to describe it again for content accessibility purposes. So uh, kicking it off, want great tech products or services and who doesn't? Among other things, it takes a great team. And that's what this is all about is Bruce Tuckman's model of um, team development, which if you're not familiar um, and we'll go into it, is stood the test of time because it remains highly relevant and beneficial. So if you're a leader or you'd like to be one, a member of a team, or you might be in one in the future, and that covers just about everybody, or you're just looking to develop your related skills, this talk, which is based on Tuckman's model, but with a fresh angle, and it's this. 0% theory, 100% practical, usable information. It'll give you a practical framework with actionable tips uh, for working in and leading teams successfully. So here are the objectives for this um, quick talk. At the end, you should understand the five phases of team development, the characteristics of each phase, and then most importantly, certainly is usable strategies for effectively navigating them with speed and agility from start to finish. And here's how this talk is structured. The agenda is the introduction objectives and agenda, which we're wrapping on that right now. Some about information. The main portion of this uh, presentation, it covers the five phases of team development. Then a quick wrap up followed by takeaway. So at the end, I'll cover that I have a digital download that you can um, get a hold of that has a bibliography and also a overview visual from this presentation. So cover that at the end. And then Q&A and thank you. And speaking of Q&A, during the talk, I'm going to focus 100% on getting you the content uh, from this talk and not looking at chat or any other streams with regards to questions or feedback. But your questions and feedback are important to me so at the end of the presentation and any remaining time, I'll take that up via chat functionality. And if we run out of time or you have a question later, you can always reach out to me. My contact information is on the website for the conference. There's some information in this presentation and there's even more in the digital download. Um, so I do look forward to your feedback and your questions. Here's the about information about my company, Exceptional PPM and PMO Solutions. So those acronyms, the PPM stands for Project Portfolio Management and the PMO stands for Project Management Office. So this is really uh, an umbrella and shorthand for Project, Program, Portfolio and PMO Management, which includes Agile, Traditional, also known as Waterfall and Hybrid Approaches. So what we do exactly is we help our client organizations fortify and advance their project management capabilities so that they can best realize their strategic objectives. So every engagement is unique, but usually the goals are quicker cycle time, faster time to market, higher satisfaction, on budget, on time, and the list goes on. And so confident are we uh, that we have a delighted client guarantee. So here's some information about me, some of which I guess I already highlighted, and that's that um, I'm the founder and CEO of Exceptional, and I am a project management consultant practitioner, author, and speaker. And I'm quite honored that content from my books, speaking engagements, and other sources have been featured and used by a variety of different sources, such as media outlets, publications, businesses, governments, universities. And here are just a few examples. I won't list them all, 
but I'll, uh, here I'll list uh, Yahoo Finance, Techstars, Computer Weekly, the United States Department of Energy, Gartner Cisco, Ford, Sweden's Innovation Management, uh, New Zealand government, Tufts University, and the list goes on. Here are my professional credentials for anyone curious. The first four speak to Agile and Scrum in particular. And then the fifth one is by most accounts, the gold standard for project management, which is the Project Management Institute's Project Management Professional or PMP for short. And rounding them out is ITIL and uh, Lean Six Sigma Greenbelt. And then lastly, in terms of the about information, my background spans diverse industries from advanced tech, consumer products, entertainment, government, media, tech, telco, and others. So here is the main uh, portion for this talk, the five phases of team development. And as mentioned earlier, 0% theory, 100% practical information. And that's the case. Before getting into the detail, however, I found that it's uh, helpful to give some background context. So maybe for about a minute or so, I'll do that here. Um, Bruce Tuckman, who got his doctorate in psychology from Princeton U University, did some extensive research on team dynamics. And that's also referred to by some as team performance, group dynamics, group performance, and so on. Anyways, he, he published um, his model in 1965, way back in 1965. But most importantly, this model remains highly relevant and beneficial today for people in tech and in all industries and sectors. And I'll give you some examples of that. So this presentation draws on my own firsthand real world experience, but is also supported by uh, Tuckman's own research, research recommendation and coverage sense from a variety of organizations. I thought you might be interested in seeing just a few uh, who have published um, materials in support of Tuckman's model. And I won't list them all, but Microsoft, IEEE, Harvard Business Review, MIT, Project Management Institute, and many, many, many more. The details to these nine sources and more are in the download uh, as part of the select bibliography for this presentation. So if you're curious and would like to learn more, uh, there is that information for you through the download. So I want to underscore the model's continuing relevance and value. So all those sources I just showed you, I deliberately picked some diverse ones and they're all published in the last 10 years. So while Tuckman's model goes back to 1965, all those examples I gave you, and I could have given you thousands, but all are in the last 10 years and many of them in the, in the last year, actually. So in terms of models, I don't know about you, but I find that it's often best to convey these kinds of concepts through visual supported by uh, you know, practical information and examples. So that's what I've done here. And I really contemplated exactly the best way of presenting the information so that it would be uh, conveyed and understood and be usable for you. And so I reflected on different options, you know, the standard fare, at least for this presentation, there's no clip art. No, no clip art. And there's definitely no stock photos and absolutely no generic content. None of that works here for this presentation. And so here's the phases of team development, which again is a custom visual that I created. And it gives the overview of the five phases of team development. Now I realized that this particular view might be difficult to make out the detail, but in about a minute or so, we'll start going through the phases in detail. So you'll be able to, to make out that information better on screen at that time. Before moving on, I wanna mention a couple of things. Um, the first is that the overall, how this model works overall, and that is to accompany this overall visual. And that is that teams typically go through all five phases from left to right, 
forming, storming, norming, performing, and adjourning. They're typical and inevitable for teams to grow and tackle problems and deliver results, according to Bruce Tuckman and countless research since. Um, below the graph is a table, and the table has the columns with the five phases. And then the first row uh, in the table is characteristics. So these are the things that you typically see, the behaviors that are typically exhibited during each respective phase. So it's almost can be used for, you know, if you're not already familiar with the phases, sort of to diagnose where the team is, if you will. And then the second row in the table are strategies. These are the proven practical things that can be done to help the team grow and improve. And that typically means move on to the next phase. So that's the overview. And we'll go through each phase in detail in just a moment, but you know, that's nice just to have the phases, but you know, we're talking about people. And again, I didn't want any clip art or any uh, stock photos or anything generic. And I wanted something maybe to be, while this topic can be quite valuable, important and serious in some regards, there's no reason that this presentation can't be light and fun. And so, or as light and fun as possible. So I reflected on, you know, Tuckman's model was created in 1965. What was created around that time frame that might be able to leverage and incorporate an aspect of in this presentation to accompany the visual for the phases? And while I'm referring to the team, to have a visual for the team in, in the five different phases. And uh, here's what I found. So I don't know if there's any Lego fans out there. So these characters were originally created in 1969. Obviously the Lego versions, this is a photo of the figures. The Lego version is, uh, you know, uh, more recent, right? Uh, compared to, to them being introduced in 1969. But these um, characters will be utilized in terms of representing the team in the presentation to accompany the overview visual. So here we go. First up is forming. And here we have a visual of a group of people coming together. They've been assembled to produce a unique product or service or improvement or some other form of work, right? So they, they're forming to, for that end and that purpose. And here's what you typically see. Now, these are typical, um, these characteristics and also the strategies, I should say, apply whether the team has worked together before they're all new or some combination. Obviously, if a team has worked together before well, they're gonna go through the phases more quickly than a team that um, probably, than a team that's never worked together before. Anyways, I'm getting ahead of myself. Here are the characteristics of the team during the first phase forming. Things are new. There's often a little bit of excitement in the air. So there's eagerness and there's socializing, especially if one or more of the team members haven't worked together before. In terms of tone, people are generally polite, sticking to safe topics, but you know, even if information's furnished at this point about this new thing that they're working on, there's still some uncertainty about exactly how they fit in and how they're gonna be able to um, be successful in this endeavor. So some questioning is, is typical and expected during the forming stage. And then here's the things that can be done to help the team grow in advance. Now, these can be done by somebody who's within the team. Maybe it is a project manager, maybe it is a scrum master, maybe it's somebody who's involved with the team but not directly in the team, like an executive champion or a sponsor or somebody else. It doesn't really matter who that person is. These are the strategies that can be employed to help the team grow in advance and move on to the next phase. Being highly visible, taking a leadership role in terms of you know, the opposite of being in the back seat, being in the front seat and being very directive about matters. And what I mean by that, for example, is if one or more people haven't worked on the team before, facilitating the introductions is um, extremely helpful. Some companies do icebreakers, some don't, that's up to you. And then if there is any big picture information or success criteria, 
now's the time to share it. Maybe there, maybe I'll give you a hypothetical. Maybe the team um, is charged with delivering a new groundbreaking product or service and launching it on or before January 1st. Um, you know, if that's the case, it's good to know it now, right? Versus later on. Um, so whatever the success criteria or the big picture is, including, you know, how it aligns with the company's mission and vision can be extremely helpful um, for the team to be successful and help them grow and advance on. And whenever there's any questions or issues, quick response time is essential. And so moving on to storming, and these labels, I suppose, to an extent are self-explanatory. But again, I want to reiterate that Bruce Tuckman and others have validated that these are inevitable for teams to go through these phases and uh, be successful. So for storming, you have a very different visual compared to norming. What typically happens during storming is there's based primarily on different opinions and feelings there's maybe some resistance and maybe even some lack of participation at the 100% level. There might be some competition within the organization or within the team rather for who's sort of the formal and informal lead. Um, and then compared with other phases, high emotions. But you know, here's a tip off, a hint that the team is starting to move out of storming and into norming. And that is when things start to quiet down. Um, and here we go with strategies to help the team. So requesting and encouraging feedback. So not a one-off request, like if you have feedback, let me know. I mean, that's fine, but that's not enough. That's not sufficient. Asking for feedback, asking repeatedly. Maybe it's orally, verbally, and also in writing. Maybe it is also important, well, it is important to have the proper tone and body language for example, if somebody comes to you with feedback, you want to thank them for the feedback. And so they go back and share that with their team members. And so that you're more likely to get more feedback. And, you know, one of the reasons for that is, and there's many, but one of the reasons for that is some issues will be obvious, but not all issues will be obvious, but by getting the feedback, you can uncover them and help in their resolution. And um, honoring commitments goes a long ways in building trust. That is really the mechanism for building trust primarily in the storming phase. And I'll give an example. Um, well, I'll start the example now and I'll pick it up in a minute. An example might be um, a commitment is that every workday between nine and 9.15, the team is gonna get together. Some people call this a stand-up meeting or um, you know, a, a daily scrum or something like that. But anyways, it doesn't matter whether you're agile or not, I'm just giving you a hypothetical. So the team is gonna get together every workday from nine to 9.15 and update each other on and sync up on what's been accomplished since the last meeting and what they're gonna work on in the now new business day. And then any issues that they need to, need to discuss. So that would be an example of a commitment, but, and then that would need to be honored. Moving on to norming, and I'll continue that example in a moment. Moving on to norming, you have very different visual here. I'm going to jump on to the um, fourth bullet point. Oh, no, I'll make that the last bullet point because it really speaks to the visual more than any of the other ones do, for me at least. And that's that the team is starting to develop some cohesion, maybe some formal or informal structure. Some refer to this as self-managing -manage, or self-organization. Anyways, the purpose and goals compared to with earlier phases are much more well understood during norming. And so the byproduct of that is that uh, typically the team members are more confident and their commitment is improved and they're supportive. Compared with earlier phases, there's lower anxiety. So it's normal to be anxious during storming or have a level of anxiety during storming and that is lowered or eliminated during the norming phase. And the team is developing cohesion, which I guess I already mentioned. In terms of strategies to help them grow and advance, which really means move on to the next phase, uh, recognizing efforts, both at the individual and the team level, giving feedback, 
Well, feedback is consistent throughout, but it bears repeating. Learning opportunities, perhaps, related to the work that they're doing, and delegation from within the team, and um, monitoring the energy of the team. You know, I do want to revisit the example I gave you. I guess I've revisited it already twice, but of the daily stand-up meeting. An example of building trust would be to have the meeting when you say you're going to have the meeting. If was, things happen and maybe a meeting gets canceled, so I'm not referring to that, but let's say the meeting gets canceled two or three times in a row. Well, those commitments aren't being honored and that will erode at trust. So that really speaks to all phases, but I wanted to add that amend the example I gave you with that extra uh, bit of information. So the team is norming, which is the second highest level regarding performance. So the next level is the highest and that's performing. So if all's going well, you're really just monitoring the team. If there's any issues or problems are being tackled. So this is related to why it says I'm monitoring the energy of the team. So the next is the highest level of performance, which is called performing. And here you have quite a different visual. And this visual probably speaks best to, I'm thinking it's the fourth bullet point. Yeah, the fourth bullet point is demonstrations of interdependence and self-management. Some refer to that as self-organization. So this is why the visual, I'm using the visuals to accompany of the team to accompany um, the characteristics and the strategies so that you can kind of see how things change in terms of the interactions within the team. And um, what you typically see characteristics wise during performing is high motivation, trust and empathy, consistent performance, because they're delivering this at the highest level of performance, um, the individuals deferring to the team needs typically it bears repeating that there's inter interdependence and self-management. They're producing deliverables. I guess I already covered that. And there's a balance of task and process. And I, if I had to word that differently, I would say that mindful of strategic and tactical, big picture, but also just attentive to the tasks. And um, that's really ensuring success in terms of the delivery. And that's why this is the performing phase. Now, you might ask me, and it would be a fair question, well, wh why are there strategies to help them move it? This is the highest level of the five phases. And the answer is, well, this is an active phase, not until this phase is over, and we're talking about a journey, which is next, um, is everything done. So the team is active. So they're actively performing right now. So the role is guiding from the side or minimal intervention, celebrating milestone successes along the way. And the team is probably already, you know, um, doing some collective decision-making and problem solving. So if they are, you're encouraging them to maintain that. And if they aren't, you're encouraging them to start doing that. So this is really more about keeping the momentum moving um, during the performing phase in terms of the role uh, for strategies. And then the last phase is a journey. And the visual here, quite different from all the other ones, of course. And the team is done. They are disbanding. So if you were to Google or whatever your search engine of preferences, if you were to Google Bruce Tuckman or faces of team development or my name <laughs> or any combination therein, you would get uh, a lot of results, first of all. Some of them would refer to four phases of team development. And that's not quite right. And here's why. There are five phases. And the reason I say there are five phases is because Bruce Tuckman did introduce four phases, forming, storming, norming, performing in 1965, but Bruce Tuckman updated his own model in 1977 to include a journey. So since Bruce Tuckman updated his own model to include five phases, there are five phases. 
But if people um, ever mention four, or you come across any literature that talks about four, now you know why that might be. Um, this final phase is sometimes referred to as outperforming, transitioning, transitioning, or mourning. I'll give you an example. It may not be so obvious, actually. So the team is successful. Everything's done. There's some pride, maybe some celebrations, more on that in a moment. But, you know, I'll give you an extreme case, uh, not typical, but to, just to illustrate the point. Let's say the team had 100 people, not five. And let's say they worked on this for a year. And let's say the result was fantastic and they were able to disrupt the industry in a good way, meaning they achieved the goal and they have many more customers and more revenue and there's promotions and growth in the company as a result and the list goes on and on. So that's great, but everything's over and people get disbanded and they get returned to wherever they were working previously um, if they were working on this project full time. And so sadness is not unusual. It might be counterintuitive with all the joy and happiness and celebration that there would also be sadness, but there can be. And it's important to realize that that might be the case, but there are things that can be done about that. And so strategies to help the team grow, here's another question you might ask me, and it would be a fair question. And that's, well, how can that be the thing's over? Well, this is really strategies to help the team and the company grow um, as well as the individuals. So here's what can be done. Recognizing change, right? Being very clear that where people were before this project started, they were on this project for however long they were on it. And, and what's happening now is they're returning to their uh, former um, departments or whatever the situation is in your organization for the project. So things that can be done is evaluations, both at the individual and also the team level. Some refer to this as lessons learned, post-mortem, post-project review, retrospective, and the list goes on and on. It doesn't really matter what you call it. What typically happens is the question wording might vary and does vary actually, but you're typically capturing what went well, what didn't go well, and what would you change or improve going forward? And so that's very important because it will give the company an advantage if there is a similar project in the future so that they can um, leverage that learning and being at an advantage again, compared with not having that information and that history and perspective. So acknowledgements are, um, I guess I covered that already, but providing acknowledgements are quite helpful and important and some form of celebration. It may or may not be a party. In the case of a big one-year project with a major product release with tremendous success, perhaps there's a internal company party on, on, on premises, you know, I'm talking about post COVID, but on premises, and maybe there's a party afterwards also that's just the team that's offsite at a restaurant or whatever. There's a mil million possibilities. The term after party has multiple connotations. First of all, after in the sense that the project or the work that was done is completed. So this is an after party in that regards and also after party in the sense that it's, it's not unusual, especially on the larger projects to have one party after another, after another. So there's the party, the after party, and the after, after party. So the message is party, quite helpful. So I mentioned the examples of the kinds of questions that usually occur during the retrospective um, or the post-project review or whatever label you use. And um, here are a couple alternative questions that you might want to contemplate if you haven't already, because it can get a bit tiring to be keep asked the same question over and over again on all of your projects, especially if you have a shorter project cycle, like it running every two weeks or a month or something in an agile situation. So here's a question that perhaps the team can ask and answer. How can we, the team, make an even bigger positive impact on the company? 
So this is very open and subject to interpretation. And that's not bad. That's a good thing. And you will uncover all kinds of information that you wouldn't otherwise if you were just to ask what went well and what didn't go well, typically. And here's another one along the same lines. How can we, the team, achieve even greater ease of work going forward? And then perhaps there were issues or problems that weren't major and you know um, weren't formally surfaced during the project, but maybe somebody, well, if we, if we only had the latest version of that Microsoft tool, that would have been helpful. You know, things come out when you ask these questions that wouldn't come out otherwise in most cases. So I just wanted to give you two alternatives to, uh, to consider in addition to maybe more the more standard typical questions. So those are the key highlights for the five phases of team development. And if I didn't mention it already, the direction is almost always from left to right, meaning the team goes from forming to storming to norming to performing to a journey. There are some cases and they're usually very rare but there are some cases where the team can go in the opposite direction. But the good news is that you have the characteristics and the strategies so that you can diagnose where the team is and know what you can do that are proven strategies to help the team get back on track. I'll give you a rather um, straightforward example of um, the direction moving in the opposite, the normal direction. And that is, let's say there's a team of five people and they're a, a web development project team and they've been working together for quite a while and they're very successful and they're in the performing stage for sure. But let's say that two out of the five move from uh, the London office to the New York office and the company just hired two new people to replace them. Well, What's probably going to happen is, this is my hypothetical example, so I can tell you what's going to happen, but in the real world, what will probably happen is the same thing, and that's that the team reverts to the forming stage, right? And then they move through storming and norming and get back to performing again. So there are examples or cases where the direction can move from, uh, from right to left, but again, you have the information to diagnose where they are and the proven strategies to help them move on to the next phase. So to quickly wrap up, forming, storming, norming, performing, and adjourning are all necessary and inevitable for teams to grow and deliver results. This presentation uh, presented the, I said that twice, the five phases of team development and described the characteristics of each one and gave you most importantly the usable strategies for navigating them uh, from start to finish with speed and agility, which is really fast tracking them for success. So absent of the strategies, it would take the team longer to get from uh, forming to performing, for example, than if these strategies are employed. So here's information on the takeaway. Uh, the examples I showed you earlier on screen Harvard Business Review, Microsoft, and so on, and others are listed in the select bibliography. And then I also have the visual for you. Um, so this is a two-page high-resolution PDF. And if you'd like it, you can get it by going to bit.ly slash take dash cz. So I'll spell it out, B-I-T dot L-Y forward slash T-A-K-E dash C as in Charlie, Z as in zebra. So uh, if you were to Google faces of team development or my name or Tuckman, you know, you'll see some materials, you'll probably see some materials I produced previously. And at first glance, they may look identical or very close to the material I have here. Every one to two years, I update the material it hasn't been updated until about a, uh, um, the last time it was updated was about a year and a half ago, but I just now for you updated it here for this presentation, for this download. Sometime in the coming new year, 
I'll also release this on blogs and Twitter and Instagram and Pinterest and all the other LinkedIn and all the other social media platforms. But for now, you have this updated version and high resolution. Others do not have this information. It was produced just for you for attending this conference. And um, I also have this URL on the last slide as well. So I hope that you're able to use these proven strategies to help your teams go farther, faster. And I'd like to go through the thank yous here. I wanna thank first you for attending this um, conference and this talk. I appreciate it. Thank you to the conference organizers and thank you for a thank you to the sponsor, Red Hat. Um, without you, the organizers and the sponsor, this wouldn't be possible. So I appreciate it very much. And here's my last slide. Um, as I mentioned at the top of this presentation, I'm going to use the remaining time to cover any um, questions or feedback that you might happen to have. If, I don't, if we don't have time to get to you, or if you have a question later, um, you can contact me through uh, information that I have on the conference website. I have the digital download, which also has my information about my website and other ways to reach me. And, um, and then of course, there's my Twitter handle right here on this slide as well. So I look forward to your questions and your feedback. And I wanna let the organizers know that I'm going to um, end the video feed in just a second here and then jump on to chat to answer any questions or address any feedback that people have. Thank you once again for attending the conference and this talk. But first the team, I hope you're able to use the information for your advantage. Thank you again.